Okay, so we'll start off with some announcements and general things. So first thing is, do we have any last minute announcements for Closure Bridge? Anything you you would need to get out? So Closure Bridge is this weekend. Uh, if you yeah, we've, everybody who signed up for a T, to be a TA was you know came to our came to our thing already. If you happen to want to know more about it. Uh, ask Nola, uh, like, or you know somebody who might want to participate. We've got, we've still got some, we've got, still got open slots. Um, uh, we're having our after event at Pinballs, and if you're interested in joining us, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's, a, that's a reasonable thing uh, to meet, you know, to meet more. If you just want to come play some pinball with us, and uh, hopefully some of the students, then uh, uh, that's great. But we're doing it this weekend, and uh, it's going to be awesome. Um, you said Lambda Conf. Lambda have, Conf. I have a ten percent discount code, so I think it's three hundred dollars now. So stay up thirty bucks, good to go. Um, they've just passed their early bird tickets, but it looks pretty good. There's all kinds of functional languages, so I might actually go. Yes, it's close. Is, it, is Colorado drivable from here? Like realistically, not really, huh? It's like. Well, two days. Two days, maybe. Easy, 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 you could do it one. It'd be a long, hard, hard one. Day. Hard, hard, hard one. Day. Yes. See, I, I, I see. If I go to a conference now, my my wife will want to come, and she'll want they to bring the kids. They have childcare. And well, I, I'm more concerned about getting because I'm not taking a you know a, a one year old on a plane. I'm not I'm not that mean to the people around me, <laughs> and I don't want to die. Uh, so <laughs> it's it's drive or you know don't go. I think so. Is any is anybody th anybody else thinking about going? Well, if you are discount code, did you posted it though, didn't you? Is it on the? I didn't post it. I said not to share it publicly. Oh, okay. But it's Capital Austin dash Capital Closure. All right, Capital Austin. A here. We'll put it on here, and uh, we'll publicly distribute it here. On I don't know if the, by the way they're pro the video is probably on for you new people. So, uh, uh, so uh, we're, uh, so if, if that bothers you, and nobody if you're if you're back there, you're not you're not on. So. Uh, but I will, I will point that out. Uh, Austin dash closure? Yep. Okay, there you go. So, and if you can't remember it, just ask Nola. Any other announcements, things? Okay, uh, at Steve's suggestion, we're going to start putting a time at the beginning for people to ask questions, if you have any. If you haven't, if the, the only rule will be if it takes us more, if we, if we, wrap, if we go down a hole for more than like you know, three or four minutes, save it for like after the meeting. But this is he, Steve thought it would be a good idea. You know, sometimes he runs into questions. Does it, I know nobody was expecting this question. What are the other five lists? We don't know. Uh, how, that depends on what the people in this room want to talk about. We don't have a list yet. Oh. It's it's ba we, we're basically just going off you know the seven languages, seven databases, oh. right? Like so, we said let's do a seven list right there because there's a, you know, there's way more than seven, and there's got to be at least seven of interest enough that somebody would want to talk about one of them. Uh, so Dar was thinking about doing. What were you thinking about? Arc. arc. Yeah, yeah. So we might do Arc. Um, uh, if anybody else has a list or you know, that they want to do, and it can be it can be anything from a full on talk, a big talk like Sands, like a small one like mine, or just like a five minute like, hey, this is what it was. This is what was interesting about it. Here's some code. Hey, one more down, right? It doesn't have to be much. So I would love to see somebody talk about a racket. And I would love to. Uh, what was it? Uh, somebody's talking about Shen, I think, uh, possibly, uh, maybe Reed. Uh, they're talking about Shen, which is kind of a new modern uh, uh, list. And uh, you know, again, and we'll mix this up with, you know, we'll mix this up with closure content. So uh, we we should be uh, we should we should be able to hit uh, everything. And after today, if you, know, you really like it, we can do we can definitely focus more on it. If after today you say, man, that was ridiculous, why am I here? Well, you know, then we'll like we'll keep it short. So, any other closure questions? Okay. Uh, I guess Steve was not uh, overestimated the amount of questions. So, if that's it, I think we'll just go ahead and get started because I, uh, my topic turned out to be much more interesting than I thought it was going to be. I thought I would, you know, when I first did it, I thought, okay, this will be a cool little demo. But I actually found a little bit, like I, I got really excited by it. So I might go a little bit more than my uh, ten or fifteen minutes, uh, but not much more. Uh, I hope, uh, unless there's lots of questions, and then I don't know how much Sam has, but his will be a, a, a longer presentation. Take your time. <clears throat> Easy going. All right, yeah. and we have somebody who's actually used Lisp 1.5 in the room, so uh, to fact check me and keep me honest. So, 
Hey there, Steve. Did you have any closure questions? <clears throat> we, we're, we're doing your closure questions uh, right. session. Section. And we just finished it, but... Uh, did anyone bring a question? Nobody did. Okay. Next time. All right. All right. But now everybody knows, uh, if you have a gen just a closure quote, like something you want to didn't understand, something you want to look at, and we just spent a few minutes talking about it at the beginning. So my, for, as an example, my closure question was, what is out there to uh, treat collections as, like I would a database, so I could do queries, intersections, cross... Data log. Right. Yep. It's already built in. And well, no, that's what I'm saying. What's out there to do? That? Well, there's, there's, there's data log, and then there's uh, the the well, data that's joining. That's not data log. That's joining. That's, right. That's cool. Okay. Con Contrib. I'm going to say what? set. It's set. Yeah. Yeah. Set already done. Oh, you, what? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. What function? What? Okay. Yes. Sorry. I. I interpret, when you said it's already built in. When I said data log, you said it's already built in. I interpret oh. that as saying data log is built in. No. No. Woo! Hey. We're, uh, uh, problem resolved. So, go ahead. Fire a question. Uh, debuggers. Okay, not much. I've I've been been thousands true. of debuggers. Which one is the best? Well, so uh, Sam. I'll give you a demo. For closure. For closure. Yeah. Okay, so Sam. <clears throat> Sam's been using the deb. It's really the only debugger. functional debugger that's anything more than like I'm going to set a breakpoint and stop right, and it's the one that's built into. Uh, Cursive. Cursive. Yeah. And you, Sam did a little bit of a demo, and uh, I'm sure after the meeting, uh, when we go downstairs, we go downstairs to the bar area down afterwards, and he'd love to give you a, a, a update on it. Yes. Yeah. Any other? Has there? Has anybody seen any other debugger stuff come out? That's Ritz still doesn't do anything that I can make it do, <laughs> but not really, right? Yeah. Okay. I do want to talk about how you debugged list 1.5, and I saw some stuff about it, and we'll get to it. But like, don't I want to talk about debugging too? Because I'm really kind of curious if what I found is how you actually worked or not. Okay, so uh, so I want to talk about list 1.5, uh, and uh, 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 so I, I just get ready. And why am I doing this? Because I wanted to. We wanted to go back all the way to the beginning. List 1.5 is sort of basically. Uh, the first public, as far as I can tell, it's basically the first publicly, you know, semi-publicly available uh, uh, list. It was just, you know, just a little bit ahead of like the, you know, the the, the one from uh, McCarthy's uh, paper. Uh, and uh, I, so, and I want to show it to you right here. This is list. Uh, do you like the parentheses in list? <laughs> so it turns out. So this is one of the things I discovered about this. It turns out. That Lisp, as we know it now, was never really intended to be a thing, right? Uh, if you look at uh, McCar McCarthy's paper, you, he, all the code in there is is like this, right? And it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, you call it M expressions, meta meta expressions, right? The meta language, right? And the way that they, the way at least it's described in the papers is you would write your code in this meta language. And then you would hand compile this down into, you would translate it by hand into a, a sort of a list syntax that sort of resembles what we know to do today. And then that would get run. And the, the intended, you know, or the idea was at some point, well, we're going to write a compile, you know, we're going to write something that you know, parses this meta, meta expression language, and this would be what you would be coding in, right? Uh, but uh, 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 that never happened. And we'll talk a little bit about why, or you know, as best I can tell, why. So, so you're saying his original paper had M expressions and S expressions? No, no, really, it only had uh, M expressions, and it had S expressions only to to as sort of like an implementation detail. It's like this is how we enter this meta expression into Lisp now, right? But if you look at, in fact, let me pull up the paper real quick so you can see some of this. Uh, so uh, where's my desktop? I know the article in Byte magazine had both. Go back to that. Uh, the interpreter in the manual is it using M expressions. Uh, is it? Uh, okay. so. Did I have that up here? Yeah. yeah. It's up there right uh, okay. Yeah. So, for instance, this is from the. So, when they were explaining the implementation of, you know, in this case, apply the interpreter, right? Uh, this is how, you know, this is how they wrote. You see, they wrote it with arrows. They wrote it with. If you see ands and mores, they'll be written as, you know, you know, uh, as, uh, you know, carrots, right? And uh, semicolons, you know, brackets, right? Uh, and you know, uh, I I did not know this. I, I was like I I assumed like I just sort of assumed that from the beginning like 
like parentheses sprung forth like as the grand one as the grand idea it's like that was the plan all along right this is like no it just turns out to be a uh, an accident of uh, so, yeah. Here's here's some more. You see, you know, he's you know constantly. Now this isn't the meta language, but this is sort of like explaining. You know, well actually, this this is sort of explaining. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, what it would look like. So I had this idea. What wrong slide? So I had this idea that I would kind of present like I, a Steve Jobs style and say like. I'm introducing the list today, right? So if, if I were doing it like that, but I realized I don't have the skill to, to pull that off. So instead, I'll just talk through them. And this is sort of like when I'm going through the early papers and then going through some of the discussion of it, this was sort of like what, why Lisp was interesting and Lisp 1.5 you know, being the implementation, why it was interesting. Uh, it was interesting, they created it because they wanted to do computation with symbolic expressions. Right. Uh, uh, so basically, with S expressions, you know, they, they had AI, AI-like goals, and they wanted to be able to manipulate these expressions. And there wasn't really anything uh, 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 like it. Well, there, I mean, there wasn't a lot of languages at all. Really, the only thing out at the time was Fortran, as far as I understand. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, and yeah, Fortran, you're not going to do. A, you, you, Fortran's not really a great AI language. So was the phrase symbolic expressions? Did the list community coined that, or was that when was, was that idea already around? I believe that because they because there was I read that there was some ongoing work in creating a symbolic expression version of uh, uh, Fortran, and so I think it was an idea, right? But uh, uh, I, I don't but I don't know to what degree you know what degree you know I don't know like what what, what was less responsible for ninety five percent of that or you know fifty percent I don't know you know how much, right? I don't know. Did, was that something? There was a. There was a Fortran and um, list processing. I'm trying to remember the name of it. I saw something called FLPL, Fortran. Maybe that was it. No, that's not, not it. what I'm thinking of. I don't think. Maybe it will come to hey, Norman did not huh? say in the paper what platform, what hardware was this? This was the IBM uh, 7, uh, I think the first, I think this one was 7, IBM 704 or 701. But what I'm going to demo on is the 7094. So, but it was all that same series uh, of uh, seven there's okay. seven hundred series or whatever. What the character said. What? Oh, I'm just trying to figure. Yeah, you know, just thinking through reasons why. Reasons why might have used friends. Uh, well, so they did use that. We'll, we'll get to it. They, no, no, they saying, did, first off, it was probably Ipsid. It was BCD. Yeah, yeah. It predated. Pre predated Ipsid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so the input to run it through the simulator, we have to take our text and run it through a BC, text to BCD conversion to load it into the, load it into the simulator, so. Yeah, it's fun, I, this was just, I just, I just had a blast. Okay, so one of the selling points what, of, of it was the familiar Fortran-like syntax we just saw, right? No, they didn't actually implement it, but that was sort of like, that was what they're probably like, this is, gonna, this is what it's going to be, this was our idea for it. Uh, it turns out that one of Lisp's big idea is conditional expressions. Like before that time, you had Fortran and you could you, you sort of transfer control and loop, but there wasn't really a, a conditional con, a conditional construct. And in fact, uh, I read uh, in McCarthy's later talking about it, saying that he pushed for this in uh, Algol, oh. and they implemented uh, like a what we now see as the if-then uh, uh, you know, uh, style of uh, syntax, but the conditional expressions being these arrows, where it, so this is a con, right? This is what we know as a con, right? So this is the condition, this is the value, right? Uh, so we, we have con and enclosure, right? So that you know uh, that's that idea, and not just doing that, but doing that as returning a value that was actually at the time uh, uh, novel. And given that there were only a, you know <laughs> there wasn't a lot of programming language, I mean there's a lot of novel stuff out there. But I found it interesting to find to realize that you know this was you know this was actually there was a time. You know, when this was actually when when the idea of a conditional was uh, was a completely new thing, uh, recursion. Uh, well, recursion they didn't you know they didn't obviously didn't invent recursion, but the languages at the time you know didn't involve you know uh, 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 didn't use re, you know didn't allow recursion right. And so the, the one of the ideas is well you want to be able to do these conditional recursive conditional expressions you know right. And so li, li, the Lisp uh, implementation provided a way to do uh, to do recursion and to do recursive algorithms right. And this was really an interesting thing. 
uh, garbage collection, and it provided a, uh, an interpreter. And I'll, we'll talk about what, what I mean by an interpreter. It's not quite what we would necessarily, like when I say interpreter, if, if somebody says interpreter to me, I think rebel. And that's not what it, what it was, but we'll, uh, uh, that's just my, you know, you know, that's just how I hear, hear, hear the word, right? Uh, uh, sorry, skip, skip that slide. Okay, so here are some of the things that I, that I learned as a process of doing this, and then I'll show you some code and we'll run the simulator and then get it over. So first of all, uh, as we just said, S expressions were not originally intended for coding. They had its S expressions. It was a data format, right? It was for the data, right? It was like you would, you would represent your data as S expressions, but your code would be you know, uh, 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 this higher level thing. Um, uh, why? So the, the question is why? Why? Why did? Why did M expressions not come about? Why do we code in S expressions today? Well, it turns out that uh, uh, one, it would, you know, of course, it would require some work for them to implement these uh, the, these M expressions, right? Uh, it, and they weren't exactly sure how to do it because their language used characters that they couldn't enter into the computer, right? They weren't part of the character set, like the arrow and the, you know, the carrots, right? Uh, that wasn't part of their character set. It's like, okay, well, we don't actually know, even if we had something, how are we actually gonna represent this on the computer? And what happened was they started using this for data and then for lambdas, and, uh, they, had the, and they had the ability in here to like print out the expressions and read the expressions. And, and once you had the ability to print things and read things and sort of think of it in this parenthesis form, People just said, hey, it sort of had this effect of like making it like this is the way you do things, and then people started thinking that way, and it just turned out to be sufficient, right? And so they just never really got around to uh, uh, doing uh, uh, doing anything more. Another thing I learned, okay, so what is car encoder? Of course, we've all heard car, we've all, I've always heard car, contents of the address register, contents of the decrement register. register. I'm like, well, I look at this, and like, there is no decrement register, there is no, address register, or whatever. Well, it turns out, I, you know, we just, you know, people just sort of say it wrong. Car and cutter were the contents of the address part of the, the register. So it turned out that these machines used 38-bit, uh, 38, 38, 38 bit words, and uh, uh, it was broken each word, so each memory location you know, was, was, thir was 38 bits, and there's like two 3-bit sections and two 15, 36? 36, 36, 36, 36, 36, 36, 36, 36, 36, There you go. Yeah, correct me if I made that. Four tag bits. So there's two three-bit things and two 15-bit, and so uh, it was a common thing to break, you know, they had instructions to break a memory location into the address and sort of an offset, right? Right, an offset from it, right? And so these ideas, so it wasn't like there was a register called the decrement register, which is just what I always assumed. It was actually, you take this memory location here and you load, it gets, of course, it gets loaded into a register and then there's a command to get the address part of the, you know, the operation out of it, right? So it's the address part of that, of a register, which is really just a value that comes in from memory, right? As, as, I, as I've come to uh, uh, vaguely understand. But I just, I was like shocked, I'm like, wait, like, I mean, you can't, I mean, like, I feel like I should know this, and yet, like, my world is turned upside down. There, you know, there is no spoon. There is no decrement register. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, maybe you, did, maybe you didn't suffer from that problem, but I mean, I was like, my world was, uh, my world was uh, shaken. So I also heard that this was about lambda calculus, right? That's, that's how I've heard it, right? You know, and it turns out it wasn't about lambda calculus at all, right? It the, the, uh, uh, the part, the lambda, the lambda s notation, right, the syntax was taken from Church's lambda calculus, right? But that was it. it would, he chose that just because it was a convenient way to represent a function. He just needed a way to represent a function. And lambda calculus sort of had a way to do it. And he even said, like, I didn't even understand some of lambda calculus <coughs> stuff, right? Like, you know, I but I knew that, but we knew, you know, knew what knew knew that it was a good language, it was a good way to represent functions, and that was it. So like so I and i I think I've even told people, hey, this was like an implementation of lambda calculus. Well what it, it wasn't in any way a, like that. It was just, you know, lambda notation. So but lambda goes all the way back to, you know, and the word lambda as a programming thing goes all the way back to this. Uh, I also sort of only vaguely knew this, but uh, lists, early lists have dynamic scope, which means uh, uh, 
So imagine you create a function and you, you know, inside of your, fun your closure function, so you do function and you say, and you return some value that's out, you know, in, in an outer scope, right? Well, it's not lexically scoped, right? It doesn't use the value that's above it in the code, right? Or that's scoped above it in the code. It's like, so if another function calls on top of it, uh, you know what, let me show you, just show you. I'm doing a bad job of explaining it. But I, I wrote this to test its scope. <coughs> Okay, so this, I'm jumping ahead just a, just a tad bit here. But so here I have a function burrito that returns a list of ingredient, right? And here I have an ingredient called bean, right? So you would think burrito, when, when I called burrito, it would call bean. Well, if I call it from within a function here where, the, where there's no ingredient defined in anything that's calling in, right? You know, it's going to return the right value. It's going to return this value. But if I call it from make, if make calls burrito, well, because it has an ingredient bound as a, you know, uh, as a as an attribute here, it's going to use this value. So I'll run this in a minute and show you. But that's sort of like the dynamic scope uh, uh, thing. And I, I mean, I knew, like, I know, like Emacs list has dynamic scope, but I just sort of thought, well, that's just like a peculiarity of Emacs lisp, and it. Uh, I assumed I assumed the closure, the concept of a of a, of a lambda closure, went all the way back to Lisp, and it uh, was you know from the very beginning, not a later thing on it. Speed, I mean, speed. Yeah, I I didn't know that, right? I was like I've like all this stuff. I thought I knew. I thought I I mean I thought closure was like the fundamental thing of uh, uh, of Lisp, and it uh, it wasn't. So I was again things I learned. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I didn't know what they had. I didn't assume it had macros, but I assumed macros went back pretty far. But it turns out they didn't have macros, but when they had something uh, uh, called uh, 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 f f-expressions, uh, the idea is sort of like, so uh, what is a macro? A macro is a function that when you, that, that gets called, you know, that gets, you know, it's, it gets called and it transforms your code at compile time from one, you know, one thing to another, right? So it takes the, it takes the, it takes the expression of the code in and sort of rewrites it or does something to it and passes that back to the, the uh, compiler to execute it. Well, uh, in a, a F expression, in F expert, what happens, as I understand it, is uh, the function exists, you know, exists like a macro does now, but it's actually at runtime, it gets the expression, you know, the expression passed in, and then it can eva choose to evaluate that expression, or theoretically it could manipulate it and then eval it. But it would get the expression in at runtime and then eval that expression. So that's how they did sort of more dynamic uh, things. So that's how they would implement uh, a conditional, or well, conditional, I guess, was a, might have been a special form, but that's how you, you would implement something that was like a like an if statement, right? Where you didn't want to evaluate all the args. You would get the expression in, and you would eval the uh, args you want to. So that was interesting. So macros, I don't again, I don't know when. Now I'm curious. I didn't have time to look this up. I don't know where our modern concept of macros came in. Probably scheme again, right? I don't know. Uh, any idea? Was one point five macros added it, after it was in there? That they started adding. So, so one of the variants or extensions to it. Okay, so it, it, it was fairly early, but not. It was definitely not in list 1.5. No, it was it was right after that, and then in Mac list, they got really expanded by a bunch of people. So basically, like immediately after this, then uh, <laughs> when they first started showing up, they weren't as powerful then. It was really Mac list then enter list before they started. Cool. At least that's what I heard. I wasn't there. We have, yeah. we have some extra. <laughs> yeah, yeah. May run into it. Uh, don't remember. Yeah, so I, I just found that nature. I had heard of Fexpur before because there was a strange loop talk. Oh, uh, and uh, I think it was maybe the Mathematica. There, there was a Mathematics a talk of somebody about the Mathematica, uh, how Mathematica, the language worked. And he had mentioned something about like, oh, in the before in the past we had this thing called Fexpur, and maybe we should go back and reinvestigate it. And I don't remember exactly the context, but I just remember hearing about it and being kind of curious and never really investigating. And then it popped up here. I'm like, oh, hey, cool. Now I I can pretend to know what it is, even though I just you know, maybe just barely know. So something to look up if you're interested. Uh, what I did not know at, at the time was to what degree uh, Lisp actually encouraged the sort of functional mentality that we have uh, now. 
my sort of pre impression, like when I look at a lot of like say common lisp or something, I don't really get a super functional feel from it, right? There's a lot of sets and a lot of mutation and stuff like that. And uh, so I, I assumed that function, like, like the, 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 the functional side of lisp really only sort of became a thing later on. But if you read the early papers, they talk a lot about function and they really emphasize the difference between a function and what they call a pseudo, what, what McCarthy calls a pseudo function, which would be something that has a side effect, right? And they're all, and he's really, really clear in the, in the, in, in what he writes saying, here we're doing functions and these are like pseudo functions and there's a difference between them. And I just didn't realize like how, that that actually went back to like the very beginning. I mean, I've heard people say that, but I didn't believe it because I've seen common list code. <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying to taunt Sam. Uh, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, no, but 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 no. And if you look back and like you look in the original paper, they have a higher that he uses them specifically for higher function, higher order functions. So if they have map list, which is what we know is just map, right? Enclosure, right? Uh, I mean that that goes all you know, that idea of do, you know doing that goes all the way back to the very beginning. And uh, you know, I just you know I didn't know that. Uh, this was something I just found interesting, which I kind of wanted to ask about. I was like, I always wondered, like, well, you got all this code, like, how in the world do you debug this? How do you like understand what's going on? And so these are the things that I found that these are the things that I found that they use, and I'll just talk about what they are. Kind of like closure. What? Kind of like closure. <laughs> trace count and print. <laughs> okay, so so trace. <laughs> so this is really interesting. Uh, well, first of trace. Trace is kind of we have a trace enclosure. We generally don't use it that much. But it basically, you could trace a function and would replace it with a version that would basically log, you know, print out every time you entered the function and what it, you know, passed in and out, right? So it's, uh, that was a thing. Count, this I thought was the coolest thing. I'd never thought about this. So uh, you've got a limit, you know, how do you, like you've got this thing, you've got recursion. How do you stop if you like, you know, if you, if you go too much, right? I mean, I imagine on these machines, I mean, the programs are slow to you know, execute. And if something's wrong, you want to get out of it. So they can put a count on, and this would say, uh, if I allocate, if, you know, in this, until I reset it or stop it, if I allocate more than N uh, con cells, right? If I use that much, if I, if I do that much, that means I'm just going out of control and you, and, the, and you should stop and throw an exception, right? And so they would say, you know, so you know kind of what your bound of what you should execute is, and you could put that, you know, put a count on top, and it would just, you know, if you ran out of control, it would fail immediately rather than wasting computing resources. So they counting the amount of memory that's being used? Con the, the number of con cells. Con cells. Right? Yeah, which is the amount of memory. So the way it works is like when the list would start up, this is also cool, I didn't put it on here, but the way the garbage collector worked is they, they would actually go through and they would, they would pre-allocate a bunch of yeah, you know, a bunch of cells in memory in a linked list, right? And whenever you need when you you need a new con cell, right? Which is the only kind of memory you can allocate is a you right? You would pull it off of the free list, you would use it, attach it to something, right? And then when you run out of that memory, right? Uh, then you know it would do the garbage collection, right? But it would actually yeah. And so there's one point in thing where it's pulling things off, and you could you could gate it. But that's how it is. They just had a, a li big linked list of all the potential memory that you could use uh, up front and it would just pull yeah <laughs> just pull it off there's some great uh, there's some great pictures of how that how that worked uh, uh, if there's interest maybe we can talk about it you know sometime uh, when we have a little more time but I found that like really really interesting like how did how did they actually do memory management and it was a stop the world garbage collector kind of like Java right so it, you, know, you get to the end and if it needed something it would stop uh, you know, it would pause, pause the execution and it would run its garbage collection. So it would actually use the sign bit of all of the memory cells to mark which ones could be reached from registers. And anything that wasn't, you know, that was part of, that should have been there that wasn't, it would come back and, you know, put those back on the, uh, on the, on the, you know, add them all back up to your list and uh, keep going. So uh, it's called mark and sweep. There you go. Yeah, because you, uh, you 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 go through everything, you mark mark it all, then you go back again and you know, find all the things you you know you didn't mark and you know, the, like them together. Yeah, yeah. It didn't yeah. do any compaction. Just no. made another linked list. Yeah, and I found that and I was like, wow. I mean, like, yeah, that makes okay. Yeah, that like, it's amazing. Like sometimes you think there's going to be so much complexity and like it's it's humbling. Just like wow, such a simple and it worked, right? That's I don't know. I find that very cool. Stop and copy. Yeah. yeah, and of course, uh, 
uh, system out print line, right? <laughs> Console.log, you know, whatever you want to call it. Print, you could print out an expression and it had a, you know, it printed it out in S expression format. So any piece of data, you could do it. The other thing I learned is uh, we think that, uh, we think of eval as being like the the uh, the the thing that you know is the is like the uh, yeah well is the most important thing. But it seemed to me that in the paper uh, uh, at the time they thought of it apply as being the uh, most important feature. Uh, and in fact, there was a quote. Uh, I may have to go to my Evernote to get it. I thought this was just the most interesting thing. Uh, let me pull up my Evernote again. Uh, uh, all right, so this was a quote from McCarthy in one of his uh, later things. Another way to show that Lisp was neater than Turing machines was to write a universal Lisp function and show that it's briefer and more comprehensible than the description of a universal Turing machine. So it's like it's like that was sort of like one of the one of the things are like okay we can we with apply we can take the s you know we can take this s expression in which is our code and evaluate it and do our entire program and that's really the apply eval is sort of the function of a Turing right you take some representation right. and you uh, and you execute it but it was interesting to me to see that he was actually thinking about that like he's like okay this, I want to show how can we how can we show that Lisp is an in, like this is an interesting way to do it well we can do the, essentially a Turing machine, uh, you know, something that can compute anything, right? And we can write it in our code, uh, our eval, uh, which we were showing before the meeting, you know, which is like this much, you know, w was like a much more understandable uh, uh, thing. And that's one, I think, and I think that, I think it's true. And maybe that's one of the reasons that this is sort of stuck around is because it really is a very, very uh, uh, elegant way of, of thinking about computation. Uh, I, I don't know if I was, that you apply was a universal function. Well, he, he, that's the way you if describe apply, it. If you look at if you look at the interpreter, you'll see that apply calls eval and eval calls apply. Well, yeah. So apply was the the entry point, and uh, um, if I've got it right here, um, let me just see if I can find it in here. Uh, it, he does say the he eval does use, calls eval. Yeah. And the eval calls apply. It strips out the function and calls apply on the code yeah. of the S expression. Uh, right. Let me see. So I, I I did not make that up. I pulled that out of one of his things. But may, maybe maybe uh, maybe after the meeting I'll pull it up and we can. Uh, but no, I'm to me I think of eval as being like the if you I I would think of apply as being part of a val and not I mean. Yeah, exactly. I, anyways, I think of the vowel as being the thing and apply, but he, at least as he presented it and he talked about it later, uh, uh, it seemed he, they considered at the time, or at least presented apply as being the, uh, the main idea. But I, you're right, I, I, I'm, you know, I may be making more out of that than is actually there. But we'll, I'll see if I can find what, you know, exactly the place in the paper that I was pulling that from. Uh, so in order to Im implement a vowel or apply, these are these are the five functions. These are the big five, the holy five of list. Atom. So is something an atom equal or not equal? EQ are two atoms the same, right? Uh, cons you know, construct a, uh, 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 a list and car and cutter to get the head and tail. And if you look at the code for eval, uh, these five things these these five things are implemented in the machine code, and everything about else about eval is in Lisp, right? Or can be expressed you using these five things. So this is it, these five constructs, you can build all of uh, all of Lisp from that. And it is pretty, uh, like, you think, really, can that, but look at look at the code, I mean, the, the code's not lying there. Uh, I found that pretty interesting. Uh, all right, so how can we run this today uh, to move along? I use something, I use, I, run, I ran this under something called SimH. Uh, as we talked about before, there is a Mac port for it, so you can port install SimH. Uh, we are going, I'm, what I'm about to show you is running this under the uh, 7094 uh, emulator as part of SimH. And the list system, uh, you can look at the slides later if you want to download it, uh, can be downloaded from here. So you download the list system, you have to do a little bit of a build for it to get to generate the image that, that comes in. But once you have it, what we're going to do is we just run SimH i794, right? Now, this is a simulator. 
let's take that uh, let's take that on, on and I is the uh, is the input is the is the Lisp uh, uh, code that gets input and program text is your uh, is your program uh, and then the output is going to go to a file called sys.log so that's what we're going to do now. So here's an example one. I didn't write this code. This was part of the uh, uh, of the distribution. I've got some code I wrote. Like so, I'll run the I'll run that uh, that uh, burrito one in just a second, just to show some code that uh, I did and show you the uh, dynamic scope issue. Now, so what's interesting about this? Okay, first an explanation here. Uh, test and fin. Notice these are all offset, right? So these are these are like punch card comment spaces uh, on there. So this is the control uh, for it, you know, to run a test. And when you run when you run this, the, this is a command to the Lisp system. And everything after that up until stop is your Lisp code, right? And if you look at it, uh, like there's no parenthesis here, right? So if you want to read this as you're doing it today, think of moving the parenthesis over here and then calling apply, right? So it's basically, here's the function you're calling and here's your list of args. So if we were doing this, if you had a factorial, if you had you know, you know, def factorial you know, enclosure, you'd say apply factorial to the list of five, right? Uh, uh, and that's basically uh, what it's doing. Now there's a, go ahead. Well, Am I wrong? No, okay. I'll just go ahead and finish it and I'll say what I was gonna say. Oh, no, I was just gonna say the only trick is that there's some details about uh, apply everything over here being quoted and uh, 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 so there's a few tricks like sometimes you if you if you if you think of it in modern closure terms a little bit too literally you can be slightly confused by some of the things that, that are quoted or not quoted that you might expect to be but anyways um, historical note mm -hmm. when you actually saw a list 1.5 program those the double close parens at the bottom uh -huh. there before that you call factorial uh -huh. you probably see 10 or 20 close parens and the reason was that if you were one short, then, and these were on punch cards, the card reader would consume the whole tray of cards, everybody else's program behind yours, would get consumed looking for that closed print. Okay, so I, no, no, okay, so, so here, so I actually trimmed this, so, uh, wait, where is it? Uh, yeah. Okay, so, was this what you were talking about? Yes. Okay, so I didn't know uh, that was not necessary to run the program, so I trimmed it out, assuming, I assumed it was more like decoration or something. Uh, it was. <laughs> yeah, no, but I, didn't really, I had no idea it actually served a functional thing, right? So then when you got here, would the fin stop it then? Or? Not if it was looking for a brand. Okay, so, so this actually wouldn't work. They'd actually have to be before the stop? So no, it, you you put the extra parens. The, the the list reader didn't mind if you had too many parens at the end. Right. That, that implies that it didn't care. care. Yeah, right. So it wasn't trying to match them? Yeah. Well, it was trying, it, it had to match them, but if at the end there were excess parens, it ignored them. Excess closing parens. Excess closing parens. If you had an open parent, you, you, you had a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if, if you were one short, if you had the, uh, uh, the define, and then I actually, yeah, if you just, if you just had one closing parent instead of two, yeah. then it would, yeah, just keep going. Yeah, yeah. just keep reading cards. I don't remember. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I had no idea because I saw that there. I'm like, that is just really strange. And I looked at this. I looked at the documentation, and it's like. No, it just needs stop. It doesn't need all those parentheses. And I'm like, okay, maybe that was just like, hey, look, we've got parentheses, right? Like, I like, I really had no, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me there could be like some functional. Were you testing yeah. it with par edit and like seeing that the colors didn't match up? <laughs> yeah. Couldn't you write it with par edit? You couldn't know. Uh, yeah, so so again, so just imagine the define is here. Like you can just sort of like move the parentheses over and take away one level of parentheses, and that, and you can sort of understand it as modern list. That is like you have a function, and you could also put a lambda here on, in the first argument. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I tried that a couple times just to verify. And uh, but that's basically it. So if, and so and this is where the interpreter nature of it came in. So as I was reading about it, and you know, 
they were, they were saying the so you would generally like it, it seemed to me like you would generally write your program so you'd have a bunch, you'd define a bunch of functions and then you'd sort of test them and you could just put a bunch of functions down here to sort of test your program and and see you know uh, 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 see if it worked or didn't work and you know and that was sort of you would write your you could write some functions and do it rather than putting this whole uh, uh, massive thing together so you know you want to have a function and then you you can write some tests for it or do something to use it to exercise it to make sure it works and that was so and this is the interp the interpreter nature of it was like you you can sort of just put anything in there and uh, and and let it run and uh, uh, you know so you know you, this is almost like you know it's a punch card REPL right it's a uh, uh, pretty cool all right so uh, oh and I did put stuff in here just so like if anybody goes back to the slides you can uh, 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 figure it out and then this is the output right so 80 column uh, 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 I don't know why the times don't show up here. I don't know if that was a list one five or if this is just a failure of the simulator or the uh, the uh, list run. But as I understand it, this is actually supposed to be the time. Uh, uh, maybe the simulator, I don't know, just doesn't do that well. And so, but it, it comes in for each thing. So it's saying, you know, it tells you what what it is. It, it it tells you, you know, I guess this is a trace basically. So it tells you what call you're calling for eval, right? And then uh, uh, it. Uh, uh, so this is the this is the define and then function uh, eval quote and factorial. So the argument of five and the end of eval quote. So the value is 120, right? So it, you know, basically it does it, everything. It tells you what it's about to evaluate. You know, then what the results of the evaluation was, and it just you know just run it run it out. And I have to imagine like I would have always thought like for output they would be much more terse than having a big long uh, quote like 50 times. So I don't like. I mean, it, it seems sort of like I don't know. It seems sort of like you. I just would expect. I would expect the output to be like as brief as possible, right? But I was like, hey, let's just put this quote like 10,000 uh, 10, times, and I was I was sort of surprised by that. How uh, like uh, they weren't uh, uh, conserving their output, uh, uh, but maybe uh, yeah, I don't know. All right, so let's run some of this here just to show you that it actually does work. So I will start, let's start with the factorial here. All right. So let's run 7H. Uh, uh, oh, and there is a bunch of sim H. There's a bunch of, like, so just, if you're curious about old hardware and want to play with some of this stuff, this sim H seems like, uh, you know, it's got a lot of stuff. So let's take the I and I and we'll run factorial.txt and we'll look at the output. Look at the syslog. So factorial of five is 120. Let's make sure it actually works. We'll do like a giant number, like 10. Uh, and uh, there it is, uh, uh, 3,628,800. Uh, I, was, I was able to get it up to like 20 factorial before the numbers got too big for the machine. I get it, you know. Uh, Lisp and having infinite precision arithmetic. Yeah, I don't know when that uh, 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 came around, or if I'm just doing something wrong, or if this code is doing. I didn't write this code. So let me show you the burrito one or the uh, scope one. So this was something I wrote to test out the uh, uh, scope, right? So again, so I'm going to call burrito once just to see what it is, and I should get a I should get bean because you know there's nothing in there. Second time. Uh, I'm gonna call it with potato, and it, but it should still be bean because it should be you know there's nothing in between, right? But I call it with potato. This getting set as the ingredient higher up in the scope, so it's gonna so I'm gonna expect it to say uh, bean bean potato. And let's find out. Uh, scope. All right, so ingredient bean, ingredient bean, ingredient potato. Wait, no, bean. So sometimes it's hard to read, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know how. Beans and potatoes. Yeah. So this is the function definition, function eval quote. All right, so burrito is called by itself and it got bean. Then make one is called with the argument, make one is called with the argument of potato and it returned bean. Make two is called with the, uh, end of eval code. Did I miss, did I miss this up? <laughs> yeah, maybe I don't know. Uh, make two. Potato, 
So make one, that's the one I'm concerned about. Make one. Huh. Okay, that looks different than earlier. Right but anyways, you see the general idea. I won't, I won't, I won't get uh, 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 stuck up on the code here. Uh, and that's it. So you can you can write. I actually wrote a few other uh, uh, small things just to test it out. But uh, yeah, I would say you know give it a give it a play because uh, this code here. I mean, it's not really like uh, all. I mean, you know, if you know if you squint a little bit, you can you can kind of like pretty quickly you know translate what you would write in closure uh, into the. Not always you're gonna have sets or keywords or you know things like that, right? Uh, or, or any any of the really fancy stuff, but like your basic code, right? I wanted to sit down and like write a foreclosure problem or something like that in it, just to, but I just didn't have enough time uh, 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 to make that happen. So if you want to learn more about this, of course, the instructions for running this simulator or the links to it are on here. These are the sources that I everything I said I'll put on the slides. I tried to get from a, you know a, what I consider to be a, a authoritative source. So the original paper, uh, Recursive Functions of Symbolic Express Expressions and Their Computation by a Machine, part one. I don't think there was ever a part two. Uh, uh, that's available online. Uh, the List 1.5 Programmer's Manual, this book right here, uh, uh, is available online. Uh, and I read, I, read, I read through every page of that and was fascinated by, by it. Uh, and of course, uh, McCarthy's History of List, which sort of put some of the pieces together and gave me some context. And so, I mean, of course, that's from his memory. It's my interpretation of what he wrote about his memory of so, like basis in reality. You know, I can't verify, but I, I did my best to uh, to be accurate. And since I didn't get since I didn't get too many uh, 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 looks, I, hopefully, I was uh, reasonably uh, uh, reasonably close on some of that. So, any questions? Any? Well, you kind of made that slide about like the web stuff like this, but you weren't going to ask the question. So uh -huh. when did LISP become what people think LISP is? LISP is like, it's all parentheses. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know when, when like, I mean, or it actually turns out that the way people actually worked, like, I, well, so I guess the real question is, when did, when did M expression sort of just fall away as a thing? Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> when I learned LISP, from the 1.5 manual, um, the the M expressions were uh, explained away, and the language was with parens. So the, the parens had pretty well taken over. The... So it, it seemed to be like I mean, from what, what McCarthy said in his uh, history of this was basically that uh, it just sort of like, they always like thought like at some point we'll implement this and it just sort of be, became that people just got so used to using the parentheses that just became the way you worked. And it was sufficient, you know, it got the job done and just pe that's how people started thinking. They're like, well, we don't actually need that. And it's like, they never, but he never, they actually never actually said, he never actually got to a point where they said, we're never gonna do that. It's just, it just never, just never, never happened, right? Like it never became a, a priority or never became a thing, so. I got it was about 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think par, par edit. I so I don't know when when par edit style editing came around, but when I first learned Lisp and say like 94, 95, uh, at, at UT, which was a pretty good AI department and had a few Lisp aficionados. None of nobody there knew, had anything like that, right? I, I don't know that it didn't exist or did exist, but they didn't use. In fact, I I was shocked. But I mean, I mean, I saw dangling parentheses and like, uh, un, like no, like I mean, it was. This is why I didn't go in. I mean, this is why I didn't really play with lists much, much more after my class. I'm like, this looks ridiculous. These guys are like, like how do you how do you get anything done? It wasn't, but it wasn't until I discovered part of my. Man, let's, I mean, parentheses are the greatest thing ever. It's like so trivial to manip manipulate them. So, yeah, I don't, but I don't know when structured editing actually. Does anybody have any idea when structured editing well, became a thing? Punch cards, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> one of the first structure editors was at Xerox Park in 74, I think it was 75. It was de edit, edit, edit on uh, Interlist. And then they had. Some too on MacList, up at MIT, but the MacList wasn't so much uh, concerned about that before Xerox was. Xerox was a little more visual too. The MacList stuff was originally using like Tico macros and stuff from there. 
old editors from everything I've read. And again, I haven't used those personally. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about common list. The uh, much later follow on to uh, what Norman showed you, much later. And uh, if I can find the screen now, I put a little triangle. Are you still sharing the screen? No, I took it off. It took a second for it to come up for me, too. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and explain what the common part is, and then I'm going to show some common lists, some basic stuff. And then I'm going to rant about some common list stuff in the positive way, because I actually like it. I have a general question. Sure. What unites all of the lists? We're going to cover that. Okay. So we're going to cover like different implementations of common lists. We're going to talk about that at all. Yes. <laughs> In common list, I'll I'll talk about it. I don't think you'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised how side effecting some of the older code. Exactly. No, this is exactly the point I was trying to make when I said I didn't Classic. like I didn't actually believe that the functional ideas went back so far. Because when you look at some of this old list code, it looks like. Like it's just set everywhere. It's like mutability. It's like you know, mutability plus parentheses without par in it. Like that's like a losing combination. Is what I thought. A lot of work training back then. Yeah. Parentheses. Yeah. All right. Looks like you're there, Sam. Okay. Cool. You're saying it wasn't very functional to be. No, it, it, I was surprised that it, there was actually as much of an emphasis on function. But you know, <clears throat> functional programming, like functions as an idea, higher order functions. Right, and the di really strong distinction made between uh, functions and pseudo functions, which are things with side effects. It's like they, it was really something that they were thinking about, even though they had some ways to do side effects, especially in pro pro prod blocks, which I didn't talk about at all. Right, but like it would like you, know, you still did that, but like the function itself should like not affect anything. And uh, you know, there's a couple side effecty kind of things that you could do, and they say basically. Don't ever do these things, or don't do these without being super careful. Because just imagine if you set something and you make a loop or something, and you're, you know, right? You just everything blows up, right? So like super careful, like you know, uh, to to just to, to, to make that distinction. Yeah, it was a big stress. I mean, one of the things McCarthy wanted was a symbolic language that he could describe some of his symbolic ideas that he was working on from the mathematics side. And then when he left MIT and went out west, was you know, where you, you'll hear my talk about that split, hopefully. Now, I don't have a lot of slides, but the slides go with what I'm going to say that I do have, and then from there, it's it's all over. Um, so it's an overview and some history. Most of my talks are a lot of history because you can read and type in code a lot of places. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you common list from my perspective. I've played around with it since the mid-'80s. Luckily, uh, I had some friends who worked at MCC back in the day, and so I got introduced to Lisp and Common Lisp on Lisp machines, so it kind of screwed me for the rest of my life. Question? Um, yeah. What's MCC? Microcomputer and Electronics Consortium. It's what the United States did to uh, take on the Japanese fifth generation project. They chose Prolog, we chose Lisp, we won. Pretty much. The gist of it. And then the AI went there killed everyone. Or, or would you say we lost less than they did? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, threw, we threw less hard than they did? Uh, I will still say we won and, and <laughs> ask that question as again at the end and I'll explain why. It's just the MCC over the MCC. Yeah, the yeah where, where UT has the incubator now. Um, so this is who Norman was talking to you guys about. This is, <laughs> this is when he was older. Um, these are links. I'll put up the slides so you guys can download them. But his Wikipedia page is really good. There's an interview that Guy Steele did with him at one of the conferences that I'll tell also really good. And then there's an interview that McCarthy gave about AI to a psychologist. And it's like an hour, hour and 20 minute talk. And they were talking about AI from the psychology kind of side. So 
it's not as computer science-y, but it's a really good talk. I, I liked it, so I was like, I'm going to share that tonight. Um, Norman covered a lot of, of the, the how of the first list, but some of the things that were mentioned just a minute ago. McCarthy wanted to do something that was more symbolic in terms of computer processing. Fortran was out. A lot of the computer stuff at the time was still plug boards. They still had tubes running things. You'd run six, eight hours, maybe if a tube didn't burn out. Still 10, 20,000 tubes running things. The Univac was still not out in terms of being reliably in 10 or 15 businesses. Right. Um, so he was very, very early in his conceptual ideas of wanting to do symbolic manipulation of language and mathematical equations at that time. And that's why, to Norman's point earlier, he wanted to do functions with side effects and non-side effecting functions. That's why there was composition as a structure, because his idea for the original Lisp and the symbolic computations was to compose computations like a language, right? And if you read some of the early paper like Norman talked about, it's kind of hidden in all the other language stuff, but if you look back at why they were trying to create this language in the first place, and how they stumbled up on <clears throat> using S expressions, that's because it got implemented as S expressions before they ever implemented an M expression, because some guy went off and a week later, he came back with an implementation of Lisp, because he saw what Norman showed you, there's only six basic functions you need to do the core language. And it was really slow, they didn't have a lot of memory, Right, they had maybe 4K on the computer, so it had to be super efficient, right? So, you know, when you look back at the reasons he was trying to do the research, the language kind of falls out of that. And he was a mathematician, right? He was more of a mathematician than anything. So if you think about Lisp and how functions are just like f of x of g of x, they compose and they nest, right? And if you have uh, epsilon, there's your loop counter, right? So you see the loop macro and some of the looping ideas fall in later on and, and they still compose, right? So if you really dig into that kind of thing, um, you can be really nerdy about it, right? But he's, he's the guy. Anyway, jump forward to 1977, okay? Um, there's tons of lists. McCarthy has left MIT, he's went out west to Stanford, right? He's taken his list with him, right? Your book, traveled with him across the country, right? And you got the MIT hackers working on list machine hardware, right, to implement list machines. Out west, they're implementing lists on top of PDP-10s, PDP-6s, PDP-1s, right? And it splits off out there. You get USC, you get BBN, which is a commercial company that implements a list, right? That later splits off when BBN closes down some of their list labs, and those researchers go to Xerox Park, which brought us laser printers and small talk and object oriented programming and bitmap displays and Ethernet and all kinds of other stuff. Well, in that lab, there was small talk and there was interlisp. That was one branch. So you have East Coast, West Coast. So in addition to that, you also have the Japanese and you have the French. Not so much the British, they never got into this, right? Wasn't really much of a big drop out of them. It was more French who got into it. So you have all these lists, <coughs> right? And there's a federal government here that goes, holy crap, we're paying for all this research. And we're hearing from our researchers that are doing this research that this stuff they just ran, we can't run on this machine at another university because they've got a different list. And there's a different hardware machine. And this list is written for this piece of hardware. And it's going to take a long time to port it to run on this piece of hardware. That's where they were about 1977. Right? So. 
just this sampling, there is a lot more. There were hundreds and hundreds of LISPs. Like Norman said, anybody pretty much could implement a LISP and not much code, and then it would grow from there. These group of people would add features, and these group of people would add features for their hardware. I mean, think of it back in the day. People hacked the hardware all the time, like we do with our Duino boards or Raspberry Pis. They were hacking the hardware to get it to do things, just basic things, right? And LISP being symbolic was used by some of the researchers and Fortran was used by other ones. And Algo and all these other ideas were popping up. So all these things are sitting there and ARPA, the Advanced Research Agency, is freaking out. Well, before we go into that freak out, we're gonna talk about these lists really high level. BBN list, I already said, it forked off list point five and it went out on the west coast. Three. Mac list. This actually came out of Project Mac was to create the first multi-user computer system, timeshare. Project Mac was the first timesharing system. Federal government paid a lot of money for MIT researchers to, to, to figure that. out, no, no. Doesn't have anything to do with that. I really was surprised, because right. I've heard Sam say Mac list before. I just thought he was talking about some list from the Mac. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different <laughs> one. Oh, I should have brought that one. I could have showed you that too. Um, but Project Mac was around to do timeshare system. Most people who've coded Unix and are really Unix nerds may know that Project Mac is what spun out Unix. Because the two core guys who worked on Unix, when they finished their Project Mac work, or actually were working on Unix in parallel, because they got tired of the Project Mac machines being so slow, they wrote uh, B originally, and then C dropped off of that, and then they wrote Unix. And Unix was the first successful timeshare system. <laughs> this one worked, but it wasn't great. Um, Mac list was originally based off the list 1.5 source code as well, right? And then <coughs> they renamed it on the East Coast to Mac list from list 1.5 because their fork started deviating from the one that went out to the West Coast with McCarthy and went to BBN and USC and all that. And it was originally on a PVP6 hardware, which if you've ever seen had a paper tape reader that had to bootstrap with, and you had to load in one paper tape. If you've never seen a PDP um, bootstrap from paper tape, there's a video on YouTube where you can see it and the guy loads in the paper tape and he shows you the paper tape punch and the whole thing. Before you can load the paper tape though, he has to do the bit flipping, literally flipping in the bits to cause the paper tape loader to load. So you have to key that program in first, right? And it's like a 45 minute video, you can, you can watch it. And then when you're done, thank your lucky stars that you don't have to do that because that would have drove me away from programming. Hardware would be the way to go. Franz Lisp, this company is still around today. They sell um, Franz Common Lisp. They also sell um, one of the world's most capable RDF databases called, um, um, well, they actually sell two. There's a, a Franz Cache, right? Which lets you, and you get this for free if you download the version. Um, which you guys should do later on. You can store a trillion or more uh, common list objects without thinking about it because it just creates a huge persistent memory for you. So whatever you create, it pages and all that stuff out. And then their RDF database is uh, Allegro Graph, which stores triples. Um, if you guys are interested in the newest web standards, all the semantic web is all triples. And so the federal government, some friends at the CIA and other places like that are using Allegro Graph to store huge giant databases of relationships that are queryable. Um, so they're still around today and they still use Lisp and they sell a really nice common Lisp environment. Interlisp, this is the one that came from BBN. This is where a lot of our graphical kinds of things in Lisp that we see in terms of 
nice tree layouts and all kinds of stuff like that. The first structured editor was really there. Um, I actually have a copy of this. Um, I might show it later on if I can get it running on one of my emulators. Um, and uh, it was a really nice list. The only, the only other close one um, to this was really the uh, MIT list before <coughs> 1982 or so. So why are, they, why are they all common? Well, we know the problem, right? ARPA is kind of torque. They're paying all this money and nothing can work anywhere, right? So we do this research and then it's done. We can't share it with anybody, right? That doesn't help anybody. It's like building a bullet and it won't work in the other person's gun, right? It's just not gonna work. So ARPA spent all this money, right? And a lot of the research they were funding, they wanted to get results like they could out of Xerox Park for other things that they had paid for, right? And they got lots of money from Lincoln Labs for radar and 3D CAD systems and all kinds of stuff, but they weren't seeing that out of a lot of this AI and early LISP work. So they demanded basically that all the AI projects standardize on one type of LISP. And they said, you will create a standard LISP uh, or you won't get any more money, okay? So that's where the idea of the common list came up. But as I mentioned, you have all these people and a big fight started. Our LISP is better. This function is better. We need this. Our interpretation of how things should work. Things should be dynamic. No, things should be lexical, blah, 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 right? So starting around 1982, the standardization process happened. And they fought, and you can go back and read all the emails. They're, they're still out there, right? And I mean, they were in the minutiae. And researchers from all the major computer companies, all the major universities, um, worldwide were, were in on the standardization process. And there was a lot of this still at the time, lots of dogma about which way was better, right? Because they all had their viewpoints of the research they had done, right? They had things they needed that if we do it like MIT's list was doing it, we can't do this. We're gonna have to write a crap load of code where here we've got two lines, right? Stuff like that. So they started working on this. This is actually the second edition, but the first edition of this book came out in 1984 and it served as a basis for those arguments to come around. And um, any of you who have coded Java will know the person who, who wrote that up, Guy Steele, right? He wrote up the first version of that common list language standard book, uh, first edition. Pretty much, um, they spent from 82 to 1994 working on a language standard. All that time, the AI boom happened, and then it crashed. So by the time the standard was done in 1994 and it was approved, by ANSI, the AI winter to happen. Most people quit using LISP of any significant degree, but the language was finally standardized. So all the researchers had fought for a long, long time and came up with a language that, although they were happy with, it was now stagnated because nobody was using it anymore because it had gotten a bad rap for over-promising stuff, right? It wasn't the language's fault. When you go out and have salespeople say that you're gonna be able to teach a robot how to walk by next year, right? Or you're gonna be able to, you know, teach this computer how to handle two, 300 million facts at a time, and it's gonna be able to tell you all kinds of logical conclusions from those facts. Um, and then the researchers don't even know how to do the basic things yet. Um, you get in trouble, and that's what happened in the AI winter. A lot of salespeople overpromised stuff. And a lot of the researchers thought they were gonna go faster than they were gonna, which has been a common problem with AI in the beginning. Yeah. I, I, I don't wanna downplay you know, the whole language, but why did it take approximately 14 years to... Remember the dogma? <laughs> um, 
there was very, very strong egos as well as very, very strong intellects. I mean, you, you have to remember the people doing AI research then and, and using LISP, it wasn't average Joe, right? These are people who were like doing research on really significantly complicated stuff at the time, right? And they, when they had an argument, they damn well knew what they were doing going into that argument. It wasn't my color blue is better than your color blue, right? They had things to back their viewpoints up significantly usually. It wasn't always the case, but some of them just didn't want to bend, right? And when you go for a language standard, not bending stretches things out a long time, right? Plus when the AI winter hit, it just drug out a lot of stuff too. In the back there? I was just going to say 14 years is not all that long if you look at the C standards from ANSI to like C. Yeah. Or even C++. I mean, yeah. right? C++ is a quagmire. I know, I know, yeah. but yeah, just, yeah, it was the other language it took. Yeah, I mean, ANSI's any standardization, it's always better to do de facto, right? And the reality is, is most, most people using common list, we're using the, the standard version of the language from like 1989. It just took a long, another six years, basically five years to polish off the edge cases all over the place, right? And decide whether they were gonna include OO in the standard, whether they were gonna include generators, you know, streams, stuff like that. Did McCarthy weigh in on the standard Uh Some, but he, he didn't really care. He was <laughs> off doing his real stuff. I mean, this kind of stuff, he used the language. He was going to invent what he needed. He didn't need these guys to invent anything for him. He had grad students, and he already knew how the core worked. The stuff they're talking about is, you know, streaming libraries and syntaxes and, you know, whether you're going to have lexical scope or dynamic scope. Whether it's going to be a Lisp one or Lisp two, which means uh, closure is a Lisp one. Everything's defined in a single namespace, right? Common Lisp functions are defined in a different place than variables. So when you define something, you can have something defined foo over here and something defined foo over here, and you won't get a collision, right? So when you look up values for variables, you look in the variable namespace. When you look up functions, you look in the function namespace. And it's a little more complicated than that, obviously, but those, those are the kinds of issues. And they were around that particular issue alone were huge religious arguments, right? Um, so they, they finally standardized it, right? And a lot of things still were written, <coughs> and people doing research still use common lists, right? It didn't go away. I just, when the AI winter happened, it wasn't all the marketing guys saying stuff. But people still kept using it because there was a huge benefit to finally having a single list. Right? It did pan out the way ARPA wanted it to. It's just ARPA wasn't paying for it anymore. <laughs> they weren't funding any projects basically with LISP. It got to the point where if you were going to use LISP and you were trying to get funding from ARPA, you wouldn't even mention it in your grant proposals or your funding proposals. And you wouldn't mention that you were using it anyway. Right? You just use it, and that's what it was, right? And I know that from my buddy who worked at MCC. Because eventually, he was still doing AI, but they couldn't say they were using Lisp anymore. So the unification happened around these kinds of things. And if you think you've got 100, 200 Lisp out there, they're all going to have ideas about what the standard type should be, what the type hierarchy should be, what streams should work like how packaging should happen, right? Time libraries, the OO library and all the other ones. They were all just, I mean, they all had their own opinions. It took a long time, right? So they finally did. And this turned out to be a weird side effect that nobody thought would ever would happen. In 1994, when CLOS finally got standardized, or when li Common List got standardized, it had CLOS built into it, Common List Object System, which turns out was the first ever fancy standard OO language, right? So even after 14 years, they still basically were the first to get approval from some paper that 
pragmatically didn't mean much, but it's also to this day the most powerful object oriented system. Uh, and if anybody wants to argue that, I'll just say you're wrong. By the way, <laughs> you, you, and, and I'm going to show you a little tiny bit of it, and I'll talk about a whole lot of it, but um, there is no more powerful OO language out there. Um, that being said, I'm going to skip here. No more slides, because I don't really like that many slides. Most of them are in pictures. Um, I need to make this bigger. So let me shrink my screen res down here. Um, when you when you talk about um, Lisp, you have to be careful when you talk to people. That's why we're talking about common Lisp. Norman was talking about Lisp point five because the reality is is the uh, not every Lisp works the same. The syntaxes are different, all kinds of stuff like that, right? So when you start talking about it, you can uh, you really get into really good religious wars with people like me, because I definitely am a, a list bigot. So um, and Norman will tell you that he's known me for a long time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you just a few things. Um, I've got I've got a whole bunch of stuff up here, um, and so for those of you who are using Mac, um, good for you. If you're not using a Mac, you should consider switching. It's really good. <laughs> um, I'm using Clojure uh, CL with a Z, which actually existed before Clojure with the J. And this is actually a port of the original Macintosh common list, which is a port of the original Coral common list from 1985. So this code base is made in transition a lot of places. If you go um, on the web and you type Clojure CL, they have a Windows version, a Mac version, and a Linux version, right? So you feel free to download this. Um, there's also, some other people were asking, there's a C Lisp, which is on, almost on, on all Linux boxes. You can do an app get C Lisp. It's fully conformant, has class, has the streams, all that kind of stuff. Reasonably performant too. They've been working on it a lot of years, so it compiles really nicely. Um, if you're running on the JVM, you can download uh, ARM to VR common list. Right? It'll run almost all the common list programs that you find out there as well, straight on the JVM. And you can call over to Java, right? Um, but unlike Clojure, it doesn't um, have standard concurrency stuff because common list doesn't have a standard concurrency model. Um, things are mutable just like they are in common list. So uh, keep that in mind. But you can, you can run this and you can find common list for free. They're incredibly good. Um, back in the day, you would have paid you know, 10, 20 grand for it. So um, I'm going to create a new listener. So the, in this environment, this is a, a really simple one, but most lists, um, unlike what Norman showed you, you get the REPL by bringing up the listener. That's what they call it, right? So you have a list listener. And down here at the bottom, you, you get the status about like your editor, almost like you would in Emacs. Right, and this one it's called Hemlock as the editor, and you get all the source to it. You can extend it. It's all really cool. So we're going to do the standard kind of stuff, three plus four, right? And uh, everybody see that? Okay, cool. So I just hit Command D, boom, right? I got it down there again, right? So each time it's it's copying it down there, right? So I've got it selected. So uh, what else can I do? You can do the standard kind of stuff for you, closure programmers. You can do two, go to the end, put your parentheses, you got all your math stuff, right? So this is that kind of stuff. In common list, we've got two kinds of globals. 
Def parameter and def var. What's the difference, you may ask? And why is it called def parameter? I don't remember why it's called def parameter, and I didn't take the time to look it up. I just remember that that's what it's called. And I remember this is def var, but I do remember this. One of them, you can reset the value, and one you can't. One is constant for the whole um, listener environment scope, and one you can reset, right? So, is the mutable? Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, you can look it up online by doing this. Most list environments have this, common list. You'll have some kind of menu. Um, and you can go to the hyperspec. The entire language manual is online. Oh, let me hold up that book. That's the book I showed you in the picture a little while ago. That's pretty much word for word what the standard is. <laughs> that book, yeah, versus that one, exactly. Um, so like 800 pages or so is all online. So you can select anything and you can say open the hyperspec for a uh, def parameter. And in my case, I got a, a, a walk back. So I'm gonna, I'll close that. And I'll show you that in a minute. Let's try something. Hopefully they don't crash because I have too many programs open. Oh, I'm crashing. I can't believe it. Okay. Oh. So what do we get from there? Ah, there we go. Yeah, so I just installed it for Mac ports, but it doesn't look like they have a GUI. They just have a terminal version. Yeah, the, you go to the Mac App Store, the, the GUI's there. Sorry about that. It, on the Mac Ports one, it, if you talk to me after, I'll show you how to load in the GUI. There's, there's the, the codes in there, you just have to load it in the listener. Um, to do that, let me start it again. Let me quit something. Okay, hey, I'm a slow reader. Okay, cool. So let's get our listener up again. Got our listener. So, um, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to define that one. Define that one. Right. So now I have Z. I can type Z. Boom. You're used to that from Closure, right? Um, I can type X. You got that, right? So um, in in common list, there's a there's a bunch of ways to set a variable. And uh, so I'm going to show you one. So there's set up x 10, right? So now x is 10. There's also set q x to 100. Actually, this one to 200, right? So there's that. You may be asking why is there multiple, right? Um, this one, if I remember right, is the more powerful one. Right? What did you want to? The Q, set Q. Um, it's the more powerful one. Set F can only change uh, variables, right? Set Q can change function definitions and, and other things in it. I'm not going to show you. Doesn't, doesn't one of them support destructuring or something? Well, yeah. That's, I yeah. Which one. I can't remember right now either. That's a sad thing. Um, if you use the more powerful one, which is set Q, from what I remember, you don't have to worry about set F. The only time you worry about set F is when you're in the macro. You don't want to use set Q in a macro because there's some side effects in the macro. But again, I'm speaking from like 10 years ago, so I could be misremembering. Um, right here, you guys are familiar with this, kind of from Closure. We do a quote. So we've got a list that just has a symbol called list of one thing, right? And I'm gonna get the rest of that list. What do you guys think it's gonna be? Anybody? The rest of that list? Nil. nil. It's gonna be nil, right? This is only one item in there. Which brings up something that Loader doesn't have, but common list does. In common list, and most, most other lists, besides closure, you have these things called a con cell, and Norman alluded to it, right? But the con cell has two parts. It's the first part of the cell points to the value. I'm gonna just put the number five there. 
And the second part of the cell points to the next item. These are also known as car and cutter. Back to Norman's thing. Or in common list, with the standard, you can say first and rest, so you don't have to remember all that old stuff. But that old stuff does have a benefit, which I'll show you in just a second if you do remember. So if you want to create a list of things, you have multiple con cells. So the value five there, and then this points to the next item in the list. Four points to the next item in the list. Another con cell down, and we'll make eight. And then he points to nil, right? So you can see how they can do a little linked list, right? So if you want to do a tree, you do the same kind of thing, but instead of four, this is now going to point to another con cell, which points to, let's make uh, that, uh, actually, let's make that another con cell. And you can point to the number five. You can point to a con cell. That can point to the number six. And then this can be nil, right? And then this could come out here to another con cell to the number 10. And then this would be nil, right? So now we've got a nice tree, right? So you can use these con cells to build up any kind of data structure and walk it. You just say, give me the first, give me the rest, give me the first, the rest. Now, they had this nice thing where instead of using first and rest and having a long chain of firsts and rests, you could do C-A-A-R. Give me the first, give me the first, right? So if I'm on, let's say this is the beginning, right? Give me the first, give me the first, and then it's this cell, right? You can do the same thing by saying, give me the first, or give me the last, and then the first, C-D-A-R. And you could do that up to, if I remember right, it was five in the middle. Might have been four with a C, but still, you can chain those together and walk your con cells fairly easily, right? So that saved you from first and rest, first and rest, really long things, and you just have a little short piece of text that expresses the same thing, right? And you get used to this after a while, so it makes perfect sense. And then if you if you really don't like these, you just hide them in a function that gets says get like the, the fourth thing from the second last thing, right? right? So that was kind of cool. So now if we're gonna append something, we can do that kind of command in, in common list. So there's an append function. You guys are used to the same kind of thing. <clears throat> common list is not lazy, right? It modifies things in place. So these con cells, when it comes down here, walks them just like you would a linked list in your data structures class. You'll swap those out, put a new console in, attach the pointers, and go, right? So in this case, now we have a list that has a list of things, and then we append it ABC to the end. Append always goes to the end. Whereas closure depends on the data structure, right? Because in closure, depending on the data structure that you're appending, it does the most optimal thing for that data structure's access speed, basically, right? For insertion, which is kind of cool. So now I can do, I can do, uh, let's see, um, first, right, of star. Let's see if that works. Boom. So star in common list always means the last thing that was returned from an eval, right? So that was, this was the last thing that's in star. So I said, give me the first thing out of star. Right? So that's kind of cool. Right? Let's say the rest of star star. Star star is the last two things. So this was the first thing, so now that's the first thing. So two things ago is this. So the rest of this is ABC. Right? So I'm showing you some of the environment, but those things are standardized in the language, star, star, and star. If you're using closure, you'll recognize some of those because some of those are in there, star and star, star, and closure. Most people don't use them because you're not doing a lot of that 
on the REPL, at least from what I've seen. We have star, no, we have star one, star two, star three. Right, two. but same idea, right? Instead of star, star, you say star two. Yeah. Same, same general idea, right? So let's go back here. So, so that's kind of cool. So you, you saw the basic kinds of stuff that we normally see. And uh, now I'm gonna show you a, a little loop. Uh, do list, notice the syntax is slightly different. In common list, there's no square brackets, right? You use parentheses for pretty much everything. So you have do list, it takes a argument here, which is the name of the item, like a let binding, except it's a do, this is a macro basically, right? So X is inside a let binding, and you're gonna assign this quoted list to X. So that's the let binding, and then for each element in the list, you're gonna do print X, and X gets bound to each element. So it's a nice shortcut syntax, right? It's very much like we have enclosure, except it's all square bracket E and all that. But notice, print actually adds a new line automatically. You don't have to say print line. You can control that, though. Let's look at this one. Here's another one. This one's a really cool thing. This is one of the things that made me fall in love with, with common list. So I'm gonna put this function up here called, and it's gonna be slow function. I've got a really big number, it's gonna take a minute. But basically, we're gonna define a function that does a whole bunch of times, and it's gonna add one to A, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and evaluate that. So I've got, I've got slow function defined. Notice it highlights the parents, and I'm just gonna hit Command E to define it now. Now I want to call it, right? So slow function 10, right? So hit return, there it goes. Slow function is doing some stuff, hopefully. All right, we'll see, did I define it? No, I did. Let's go here. So I've got a whole bunch of them. Can't modify the protective buffer. Kill that. Come back to here. Luckily, none of these demos require the previous one. Okay, so we got a slow function defined. Now we're gonna go down here and call it slow function 10. Right. So he's running, we're waiting for him to run. So you're seeing it's slow, it takes about 10, 15 seconds, because that's a pretty big number. I had it smaller and it was instantaneous, so mm -hmm. I made it big. And in a second I'll show you why. Or if you're really paying attention, you can see why over here, but don't look, you'll spoil it for yourself. So it's really slow, it's really slow. So we, we have that really, really slow function. Now in the interest of time, I'm gonna hit uh, Control C, and I'll show you another thing that Common List has real quick. Common List has um, basically handlers. Basically, Common List, when you break out of a function, there's a global handler that captures where you are, and you can see we got an interrupt signal. We were evaluating the top level eval function that kind of Norman was talking about in his. There's an eval function, right? And we can type command slash to continue and it'll keep on going from where we were. Period to abort or command backward slash for available restarts. Let's hit command backward slash to see our restarts. We can return from the break right away. We can return to the top level, which gets us out of the exception handler, right? Or we can restart, we can reset this thread or we completely kill this thread. So if somebody, I think it was you, was mentioning about threads, right? This common list has threading. Um, Franz common list has threading. A lot of the common lists have threading. There's just no standard for it. But you will find, um, strangely enough, a lot of them are very close to each other nowadays. Franz actually has a symmetric multiprocessing as well. If you're um, running in uh, headless mode on Linux, Windows, or Mac. 
If you're running a GUI, only on Windows. Okay? And that has to do with the event handling. Windows actually has a better event handler than uh, uh, any of the other ones for uh, UI, threaded UIs. So we're going to return from the break. Boom, right? So it invoked a restart and it's continuing, right? So I can hit command comma again. We're back in the break, right? But I can also do this. I can type colon question mark, right, down here to see other options, right? Actually, there we go, colon question mark. Okay, here's my other options now. Now we've got a ton of them, right? You can't even see all the ones. So I'm in this break point, right? I can ask for which frame number my function's on, show me the form, set a local variable, set an arg, right? I can do all kinds of things to play with the stack frame that this function's in. I can modify the stack frame and then tell it to resume, right? So I can go in and play with what's on the stack, fix it, and tell it to keep going, right? The only other system I know of that you can do that without being an assembly is small top. So this was like awesome. I can list my restarts, right? So let's do colon R. Here's my restarts, right? We saw that in the pop-up window a minute ago. But it's all, you can do it all keyboard based, right? I can pop, let's, let's go ahead and pop. We're just gonna pop out of the break point. Boom, we're back up on our cursor, right? That's all built in. For everything you write in common list, the condition system is what this call. It's basically exception handling galore. You have full access to the entire execution environment. If you've ever used a list machine, that means you can go and debug the code all the way to the point of being into the microcode, right? I.e., you could be in the Ethernet handler, the window handler, pretty much all on the list. And you can fix it and go. So that's kind of cool. No applause. You guys are complaining. <laughs> you can't debug and closure, right? You're just, I show you the ultimate here. I, yeah. A second ago, I saw something that was like CCL colon colon something. That's an that interesting space. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to show you those in a minute. Okay. So we have this uh, really slow function, and I'm actually going to make it less slow than it was because that was really slow. So we're going to paste it in here again, and uh, let's try it this time and see if it's a little bit faster. I need to give it an argument, right? Hit return. <laughs> I got rid of one zero, so that, that should speed it up a little bit. And it's 8.39. So there, it sped it up a little bit, right? So that's cool. That was fast. So now we can do the same thing, but we're going to time it. Timing's built into the language, right? So just hit return. There's a timing function. <coughs> you have to load that into closure, right? I mean, common list, the manual's so big because the language includes everything. I mean, the only thing nowadays that's that big is the Wolfram language, right? <laughs> and he, he has the same strategy. But notice the info you get, right? It tells you how, long, how many microseconds it took to run, how many CPU cores it used, that used all eight, right? How many of those seconds were in user mode, system mode? How many page faults it had to do, right? And that matters because when you get into bigger ones, where you're using lots of con cells and structs and <laughs> arrays and all that, it'll tell you all that information too. You know, it'll help you do some cool stuff. Now, in common list, you also have the ability to take any function that you have and compile it. Because Norman alluded to this earlier, earlier list had a separate interpreter and then after you were pretty sure your program was working in the interpreter, then you would feed it to the compiler. Now that worked for most cases, but the interpreters weren't always 100% congruent with the compiled version of the list. Because the interpreters had to work more dynamic scope than lexical scope back in the day. So we're gonna compile that function. Boom, it compiled that fast. Now I'm gonna give you a little clue here. Uh, Closure your common list here. As soon as you hit any function definition and you hit return, it compiles it. There is no interpreter anymore. And most lists nowadays are that way. As soon as you hit the function definition and you hit enter, it compiles it instantly, right? 
So even though we just told it to compile, it had already actually compiled. So you're not gonna see a huge speed up when I when I do this again. I thought, I thought the punchline was gonna be it optimized it. No, but there are options to it to tell it to optimize. I'm just not using it. But right out of the gate, it when you do regular code, it's already compiling it. There's no interpreter. Okay. Now it took a few more microseconds this time, right? The compiler made it worse. Something like that. <laughs> anyway, but we've compiled it now. But one of the things you don't have in Clojure and you don't have in almost every other system is the ability to see the assembly code for what you just wrote and to change the assembly code if you don't like it and patch it back in. So I just disassembled that function to the assembly code for this processor um, and we get to see the assembly code for this function, the due times, and all that stuff. That's Lispy assembly. It is Lispy assembly. That's, that's actually a, a syntax they have so you can put assembly in really quickly and efficiently. Um, and you can actually, if you see something in here that you as a human being know is you can make it more efficient, you can patch it in and tell it to compile that in and it'll That was it'll take also it. available in 1.5. Cool, I didn't know that. It's called LAP. LAP, okay. List assembly program. Okay, cool, awesome. See, from 1958, it's already awesome, right? I mean, what are all these other people taking us down the garden path, right? So I always, I always thought this was cool. Um, when I was doing Mac programming in the 80s, and learning, it was always really cool to see the Lisp code for super simple things and what the assembly would spit out. I was like, oh, this is so awesome, right? So I was like, you know, 19 at the time. So, um, so Lisp also had to standardize um, how they dealt with file paths. Because remember how I told you there were all these machines? Well, there were no directory structure standards in the day. So they had to come up with a generic way of describing all these directory structures. And Lisp has a path package, basically, in the standard that is so generic, it, to this day, it still handles basically every file system, right? So I'm just going to paste one in here. Um, if you notice, it's CD, colon CD. That's in the uh, listener shortcut, like when we're in the handlers, right? So what we're doing is basically we're CDing to this path name like you would on Unix or DOS. So we're gonna CD to there. And notice we get back an object that's a path, right? Starts with pound P. I'm gonna try this. Now look at that, I can right click on it, but he doesn't know what I'm on top of, right? So let's see if, if I say inspect, oh, brings it up, right? And it's a built-in symbol, that's all he knows about it. We don't have the path object right there. But what happens if we take... Wait, is, is that the path object or the hash p? Hash p means the path. It's, is that a reader macro? Yeah. <laughs> but, but you were getting the information on the thing, not the macro. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because your mouse was over it, so I couldn't... I wasn't yeah, right sure there. which one you were going. Right. right. But that's just the symbol, right, in the package. So I have to actually take that and assign it to something like set q, like uh, the path, right? And, that's not really a correct common list name. I should do it like that, right? And then the question I can't remember is whether that will actually work inside of a function. We'll find out right now. I don't remember if it does. Nope. So I'll come back to that later. So we're already in that path, right? And I don't, there's functions for all the path handling stuff, but I just did this on the REPL. Um, so I don't remember the exact path functions, but there's basically a whole section for doing everything you want to do at pass. I'm just doing the, uh, the cheap seats way here. So we're gonna make sure we're there. So we're there. And then when you want to load a file, there's a load, pretty much. And here I'm loading a little function called add1.lisp and I'm telling it to print out what it loads in when I hit return. And why do you want to do that? You tell it to print out so you know it loaded the stuff from the file in there. If there were multiple functions in there, it would print all the function names that are loaded. There's only one function name in that file. 
Now I can call that function because it's loaded in. I can say add one to six, hit return, I get seven. Right. So if you want to see what add one looks like, I'll bring it up. It's it's really an amazing program. <laughs> define is how you define functions in list, common list. Add one. Arguments are always in parentheses. X. And then there's a one plus function instead of ink that we have in closure. So we say one plus X and it returns last value of the function. So you get that. So that's kind of cool. <coughs> um, here's another one. Now one of the other cool things is I can evaluate it here and it'll send it over to the REPL one, right? Boom. See that? I just hit Command D. Took that. Pasted it. Output over there. Yeah. Redirects the output to the, <laughs> the, the current listener, basically, right? So that's kind of cool. So here we have uh, our next example. We're using set Q again. We set two variables, right? These aren't global, right? Because we're not using def parameter or def var. They're going to be local to this listener, right? Whereas def parameter and def var actually glow in the list namespace for the whole executing list. And then we're going to do an if. Notice the if in common list, the condition has to be inside parentheses, right? So that was one of the things Rich Hickey didn't like that he had to always do his conditions inside of parentheses. He thought it was wasteful. So there you go. We're going to see if uh, three times four is greater than five. If it is, do sign x. Otherwise, do that. So. Let's, uh, let's take this, whatever I select, and evaluate it. Boom, you got eight. It worked, obviously. Um, one of the things Norman mentioned is the equivalent of what we have in uh, um, closure would be do. In common list, it's program in, right? So if I want to do that function and then have it do a, a print uh, x there, I can do that, right? And now I still get the eight because the test is not the same up here, right? But if I do make this one and then evaluate it, right? I got the 12, right? So this program in takes both of those lines and runs them as one little statement like do and, and closure, right? And the star? Star, oh, list. Multiplication. No, 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 list, uh, list two. That's why star that's is right. Two, right? Star is not, that's right, no, it's not. It's not the no, same. I'm not colliding, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's my collider sign. Function. Like, that can't possibly work. Hey. Okay. No, I, I missed that word. The star is a function, right? So it's looking at yeah. the symbol up as a function, whereas the star before when we're getting the value. So if you oh, if, you, got you. if right. you star star star, and where 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 the last value was five, it would be twenty five, right? So type five. Yeah. Five here. Yeah, and then star 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 in parentheses, right? No star. You open paren star space open paren. Yeah. Star space star space star. Because yeah. oh. it's five. Because this two. Yep. List two. That's right. You got it. Ooh, separate bonus. separate spaces. Uh -oh. Ooh, my battery's about to die, so I better hurry up. How many? Nine minutes. Okay. <laughs> Let me turn that down. You guys can still see it, but it's really dark over here. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go really fast. We got a vowel. You can vowel anything. It's built into the language, right? Um, so I'm just going to type that. Basically, we get 16. So just whatever's in there, whatever's in the quoted expression, as long as it's valid list, but it'll run. Macros, whatever. Um, you can do apply just like you can do in Clojure. Um, here, we're going to get the fourth character out of there, right? I'm going to shrink the REPL over here so you can you can just uh, see the outputs over here onto the side. So we got the fourth character was C, right? So that was cool. And notice characters in common list for pound slash C um, over here, right? So that's uh, common list is not Unicode. It's it's ASCII. Um, you can use other character encodings, but you have to write the functions to mess with them. And uh, I'll explain how you can actually use Unicode and have it work with everything in a minute. Uh, string comparison. 
String equal. Are those two strings exactly equal? There's a function for everything. It's not an overloaded situation. Here we've got mismatch. We're going to search from the end of each string, and we're going to test whether each character is equal, right? And so then it's going to give us the index of where they mismatch, <coughs> right? That's the test, right? So in this case, did I hit return? Yeah, three. So we go back from here, right? Zero, one, two, three, right? And then the space, right? Third character in, all the way up to here, they're the same. So the third character from the end, they mismatch, right? Uh, we got all the string trimming, normal kinds of stuff. We run that one. It trims the spaces from the front, but not the center. You can trim spaces from all, the whole thing. All these kinds of functions are standard kinds of stuff we would see, but they would be in libraries. In common lists, they're built into the language, right? Here, right, look from the end for we. They find it at character 20, right? Concatenate two strings. Right there, Karl Marx. We want to concatenate them as a string. You got a string down as a result. Here we're going to do the same thing, but we want a list back. Right? When we do them as a list, we get all the characters. Individually, it treats each one of these strings as a character string. It creates a list for each of the characters. We can uppercase stuff, standard kind of things capitalize things, string capitalize, starting at position five. So here, the first capital will be the E, it'll skip that. Kind of cool stuff. My general thought is if you like some of these, steal them and put them in closure, right? Because there's a lot of good stuff in here. The formatter. We have pretty good formatting for, for closure because we get some of it from Java. But the formatting strings in Clojure are really, really powerful. Like here we're going to substitute this list in for position tilde A, right? So we get a nice output. This is a string with a list in it. We can do the same thing here. We're going to create a list of names because we gave them a list of names, right? But what if we want to put a comma between each name, right? We can do that too. Come down here. Boom, we got a comma. and. This here, this little tilde up arrow says, if it's the last one, don't put a comma. If it's any of the other ones, go ahead and put the comma. So that way you don't get a comma after brother Carl. That's just a small example of the formatters. There's, I actually haven't seen a better formatting, string formatting macro system. Um, the Java one is not even close to this. I mean, it's pretty good, but not even close to the the one of those. We're going to do another one here. This one actually, we're going to output to a stream, right? So we got a stream we're going to pass in. We're going to put the string out. We're going to do a list for each character in this. We're going to print that character to the stream. And then finally, we're going to take these two numbers and append them to the stream as well at the end. Boom. There you go. So you got it. Pretty nice. Zappa. Right. You see the characters, individual characters, but now they're on a stream. So you can treat arrays of characters, put them onto a stream, and then they just get gathered together. Doesn't know whether it's a string, a stream, it, it does the right thing, regardless of what the type is. So that's kind of cool. Much easier to deal with than some of the, uh, the Java kinds of stuff. Parse integer, you used to that, pretty straightforward. But now you can tell it where you want it to start from, right? Parse integer from position one, we get the number four. And it returns one to tell us where that was found at, position one, right? If we want to parse integer, but use radix eight, what's 42 in, in base eight? It's 34 and it, it found that at position two, right? We want it at base 10, it's 42, right? So that's, that's kind of normal stuff, but it's really easy to express here. Um, how about this? We have an encoded array. We're gonna read from that 
right? But encoded through live stream, and we get back the encoded character array and the number nine, right? So that's kind of cool. Def parameter 42, we're just creating a variable here so you can see the same thing for read from string here. And there, when we read from this string right here, we're gonna do a set Q to, to foo, right? But did it actually do that? We got foo capitalized and we got gotcha out, right? But what, what happened to foo? We got the word gotcha and then we got the value 23 because it actually evaluated it. And we got the value 23 from up above. Write to string, we can write numbers out to a string and it converted that number straight to a string. Well, it's pretty easy, you're used to that kind of stuff. Write this to string, but put it in base five. Again, pretty easy, you get a string, <coughs> kind of easy stuff. So what you're seeing here is a lot of this stuff that you guys are used to has been around for a while, right? Here I have a bug. I'm not gonna debug that one since we're low on power, but I am gonna go over here and debug this one. Here we're gonna create a hash table. Use these earmuffs in common list. That's the way you declare that you're, it's a global. You just put earmuffs on it. He's out in the cold all by himself. He's not hanging out with the cool kids inside lexical scope somewhere. So. Right, so we created a hash table. Make hash table is a built-in function that gives you back a hash table, right? And then we're gonna add an entry to the hash table. Right, I'm gonna get it out of here, and you're gonna, this syntax is gonna be weird for you guys. We're gonna look in the hash table, my hash for this entry. It's gonna give us back that entry, and then we're gonna do a set f by putting one into that entry. So it actually gives us back the entry node that has a key and a value, and we put the value at that node. Right, that's the way you gotta think of it. You have to get the node and then set its value. Right. A lot of people create helper functions for That's that. That's the destructuring I was remembering. Yeah. So it's set yeah. if it does it not set Q. You're right. You're right. That's <sighs> what happens when you don't use it for a long time. So here we can do a check. We're going to get that hash table, grab one entry. If there's something in there, we'll get key exist. If something doesn't exist, we'll get it doesn't exist, right? So that's that pretty much made sense, key does not exist, right? And then we can do this, another entry doesn't exist, so, right, we get that. Actually, I gotta, I gotta make sure I do this before I do this, right? Okay, there it is, now it can do it. Cool, so it worked, and then this one didn't work, because he doesn't exist, right? This entry, there's no name for this key, right? That symbol. Uh, we create a logarithm of this big number divided by that float, log it. Now over here, we're gonna do something similar. We're gonna do it, we create a let binding. Notice let bindings here are in a parenthesis and then there's another parenthesis. That's some of what Rich Hickey was complaining about syntax-wise, they didn't like that double nesting. Anyway, we're gonna do 20 times. We're gonna print that, create a list of that size, print it, and then we're gonna set Q to be 1.5 times as big as that. What required the double nesting? The let. The let, because you have to eval. This is the outer scope to create the let binding, and then here's the first binding size gets set to 65. It's a list of bindings. Mm -hmm. The list of bindings. Whereas when Hickey does it with square brackets, he just chunks them by two. Right. Right. Here they don't assume the chunking because you actually can do kind of tuple or you can do more complicated operations inside that inner binding. Unless you want to take something. Okay. Here's another example of the loop macro. The loop macro in uh, um, common list is like really super powerful. So I'm gonna show you a couple examples really quick. Some of my battery is not mine. I have three minutes left. Okay. Loop macro here. 
loop for all the characters across Zeppo, collect the character. Now, these things here, it knows these words. The macro actually has these for care across collect, right? Or not care, this is the, var the variable. So loop for and across and collect are part of the macro DSL. You define the variable. So the character gets bound to the variable and then you collect them all. And if you look at the output over there, we get an array of characters or a list of characters. I mean, too many languages. Here we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna for X in this one, for Y in that one, we're gonna collect a list of X and Y, right? So really easy to compose structured data. Here we can do the same thing. For X is one to five, Y is whatever X is times two, collect all the Y's, right? This is much more efficient to express in common list than it is in closure, right? Um, it could be easier in closure, but the actually the macro system in closure is less powerful than this one. Um, blasphemy, huh? Yeah, so. Um, this loop macro, X is A to B for Y is from one, right? So Y is gonna be from one, it's just gonna go, right? If Y is greater than one, we're gonna format out, otherwise we're gonna format that. And if you run it like I did, you'll see it goes A, B, C, D, E. Right, we formatted them and this capitalizes them, by the way, the capital A. That's one of the formatter keywords to capitalize. We can do the same thing here. I hate running out of time and power at the same time, <laughs> pun intended. Uh, for X from one, now we're gonna do X times 10 while Y is less than 100, print that and collect them at the same time, right? So you can see that. It printed them vertically, and then it collected them all in a list. We can do all that, a few short lines of code. It's not as, uh, not as concise. This one's actually really powerful too. Here we're gonna go from one to 10. We're gonna collect the results of this loop where Y is from one to X, collecting Y. So we're gonna have two collections, and you can see over here, First collection's one, then one and two, one, two and three, one, two, three, four, builds up. Pretty nice. Does the loop macro use the end of line as part of the syntax? No. Um, you can put them all on one line, it'll still work. It's not Python. Terrible language. Um, here's another one. This one's kind of weird. Yeah, you actually could make it work like Python because you can control the reader. Okay. You have 100% control pretty much. Um, this one lets the let binding for S be that string. We're gonna loop over from zero below the length of the string, so it's gonna be non-inclusive on the range. Get the character at that index. We're gonna find that character in this index, see if they're equal. If they are equal, we're gonna return that character. Just so happens to be at the index, the only one where the index and the character equals four. But again, try expressing that in your closure code that concisely. It all comes down to the loop macro. The macro is super powerful. If you look at the code for the loop macro, it's pretty huge. It's like lots of pages. And a lot of list programmers hate this. There's like a lot of common list programmers who hate that. And my battery died. So, um, that's the demo, I should have plugged in, but we're supposed to be out of by nine anyway. But let me finish by saying, um, common list, it, from a list standpoint, you're not gonna find a more powerful list language. <coughs> scheme is really cool, but to get scheme even close to where common list is, you have to add the object extensions, the generators, all kinds of other stuff, right? Um, if you are interested in doing more common lists or want more demos, when I have to plug in again, Feel free to ask me. If you have not read about the common list object system yet, just to enrich your neurons and to challenge yourself, do look at it. There is single-handedly no more powerful object system in the world, and it's not a limiting object system. It gives you objects where the structure is separated from the behavior. In closure, we have that with def method, right? Plus gives you all that, plus a full meta object protocol system, multiple inheritance, mix-ins, before, after, and arounds, all kinds of stuff. So um, if, you, if you're interested in it, let me know. I'll steer you toward mind-bleeding articles and demos. Thanks for coming.
Thank you. Any Thank questions? You. Good. Get up. <laughs> so we usually meet downstairs. Also, uh, if you have a talk, if somebody want, has a talk they want to give next month, tell me or Sam uh, whether it's another list for a closure thing. If not, we'll probably come back and pick up those Wonderland autos that we didn't do uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. But we would like more talks. So. And definitely, thanks for coming. If there's more questions, feel free to ask downstairs too. We usually get uh, French fried up. Next one.